Jesus' name. Amen. Now, especially those of you that raised your hand, turn to someone, all of us, but especially those that raised your hand, turn to someone and say, I'm expecting a miracle in my life. I'm expecting a miracle. I'm, I'm not, think, just be, not just things better, a miracle. I, I, I'd do it with a smile if I was you. I'm, a, I'm not just expecting things to go a little smoother. I'm expecting a miracle in my life. Amen? Going to get a little bit of excitement out of anybody today, expecting a miracle in our lives. He's not the God of hype. He's the God of hope. He's not the God of hype. He's the God of hope. We don't have to get hyped up. We don't have to get all shouting up. But we do need to get hoped up. Huh? We need to get hoped up. Why are some people doped up? Because they have no hope in their life. Seriously. Seriously. If you were living their life without hope, what would you do? But we need to get hope back on the inside of him. This is the message. He's the God of hope. It's the message of hope. We ought to be spilling over with hope, bubbling over with hope. We ought to get around people, and hope ought to be stick with them after we leave because we've been with them. Amen? And so we need to get ourselves stirred up, an expectation, a hope that God is going to... Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if, it, if, if without faith it's impossible to please God, without hope it's impossible to please God. So we need to get our hopes up. Well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, if we don't get our hopes up, we're not going to have faith, and we can pretty much be guaranteed it's not going to happen. But he's a God that wants to move in our lives. God of miracles. Amen? Supernatural miracles. Been too long, and we've seen too little. It's time for God to do some amazing things in our life. I don't know about you. I need a miracle in my life. And I can't make it happen. So I need to trust in God and expect him to, to move and manifest himself in a powerful way. Ask your neighbor, do you, ask him, do you need a miracle? Ask him, you, do, you, do you need a miracle? You know what? It's, it's easier for us to ask our neighbor if you need a miracle than it is to ask him if you need a 20. Because you might not have a 20 in your pocket, but you've got a God that can do a miracle with no problem in our life. It, the, the impossible is not impossible with God. And so let's just get stirred up a little bit on the inside that there is a supernatural God that we are serving that wants to do supernatural things in our lives and wants to use us to transform and change our lives. And just with that simple message there of, 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 of encouragement into people to just to raise up your hand, sometimes doing the, just the simple steps like that gets people's faith stirred up. God does know what I'm going through. I tell you, sometimes as church people, we did a real good, you would think this is a theater because we all act so well. But we're not actors in the body of Christ. We need to be honest in the body of Christ. And we need to be able to be uh, honest that, hey, I'm going through this. I'm struggling in this area. We need to be able to be honest. But that's not to be able to say that's where I'm stuck or that's who I am. That's just where I am and I'm just passing through this particular situation. I'm just passing through this emotion. I'm just passing through this problem. I'm just passing through this, this situation. This is not who I am. It's just what I'm passing through. The greater one's on the inside of me. God said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. I'm going to live like I sing these songs, and I'm going to experience a God who's present in my life. Getting ourselves stirred up with about the God that is on the inside of us and who is with us in our lives. If we truly believe God is with us, we can make it. Amen? We can do it. And we are encouraged to live a life that demonstrates his presence and to expect the supernatural in our lives. If we get to a point that we stop believing that God can do above and beyond, we can limit him in what he's able to do through us. Now, we don't necessarily limit God. We just limit what he can do through us. And I want to look for a little bit today in, in Acts chapter 10 about a situation where a very famous believer, a, one of the founders and, and one of the pillars of the church in the early days, he actually had limited God in his thinking. And I, I don't want us to look at this in a critical manner that we are uh, critical of the early church or we're critical of these individuals, but learning from a perspective of the symbol, when God asks us to do the unthinkable, when God asks us 
to do the unthinkable. What is our response? What do I mean by the unthinkable? You haven't thought of it yet. You could never think of you doing that. I could never, I could never see God using me in that way. Specifically today, when it goes to sharing with uh, his grace, his message, his love, his power, his forgiveness to other people. Whether you want to admit it or not, there's probably some people in your life that you would never think God would use you to reach into those people. A section of people, a race of people, a group of people, a subgroup of people that you would never think God could use you to reach into their lives. But throughout the Bible, we can see over and over that there is a good God that wants to do some incredible things on this earth, and he needs people that will allow him to use them. Or use them. We see, remember back in the Old Testament, Jonah, God wanted him to go to a, a city, and we're not just talking a, a small city, a, a major city, a, a, a hub of that area, a very influential city, Nineveh. Wanted him to go back and to preach to them repentance and to turn to God. We can see that throughout history where, where God wanted to, to use him. But he was resistant to be used of God. He didn't want to go there. He, 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 he could just, never, could, just couldn't wrap his head around it that God would want to do that. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what do I do to follow after you? And Jesus said, go sell what you have. And give it to the poor. He could not. It, that was unthinkable. To take what he had accumulated to this point, And just to give it away to the poor. We've seen that, that Peter here had a vision from God. In Acts chapter 10 in a few moments. Where he wanted him to go and preach to the Gentiles. And Peter said not so Lord. I, I'm not, not me. I, I wouldn't do something like that. It's against the Jewish law. Ananias as we look later on in Acts where God wanted to use him to go and pray for Saul, a known persecutor of the church, someone who ha was actively involved in persecuting the church. And Ananias said, God, don't you know what the situation is with that man? Every one of these people in this list, this short list here, God was asking them to do the unthinkable. Could you just say unthinkable? God was asking them to do something that in and of themselves they would never come up with. And in a sense, God has plans for every one of our lives to use us in some very unthinkable ways. And specifically, where it comes to sharing the message of salvation to the world around you. Grandview, will you please start sharing your faith with the world that is around you? Please stop being a silent witness. Stop being just a church attender. Realize the days are short, the days are getting worse. The days are getting more evil. Darkness and great darkness is covering the earth. And we need the light of the individual believer to shine in this day and in this hour. And even though you may not have thought of it, even though in the natural you would think, no way God could use someone like me. I want you to know it's not about you. It's the message that you're sharing. It's not about your qualifications. It is about his salvation that has already been given to the world. It's not about whether you'll be accepted. It is the fact that God wants to accept all men come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be a passion and a stirring on the inside of us that God can use us to reach anyone. We do not have to be just like them. We do not have to be of the same gender or the same race or the same ethnicity. We do not have to talk like them, look like them, act like them to be able to bring Jesus to save the world that is around us. And it is time for us to allow the Holy Spirit to well up big on the inside of us and to say it is beyond our imagination that what God would use us. And at that moment, God demonstrates his greatness through our lives. You see... God is asking us to do the unthinkable. He asked Jonah to go and to be able to share repentance to a city and to bring them back to God. But he didn't want to. He tried to run away from that and he ran right into disaster. The rich young ruler, Jesus invited him to be one of his followers and to be a part of the inner circle, we could say. And yet he could not see himself giving away his great wealth and so we see his name is not even mentioned, and he just dwindles back into his comfortable lifestyle, never to be used again of God. 
Peter and Ananias, both of them, both of them had great discussions with God on why what he was asking of them was unthinkable and not reasonable to do. Church, I want you to know that in this day and this hour, that God wants to use us beyond our thinking, beyond our logic, beyond our comfort, so that we can reach out to the world that is around us. And I know that instantly, automatically, there is a resistance, there is a sense of a negotiation that we want to go into with God on why it would be better for someone else to do it. But in this day and hour, and let me just rant and rave for just a few moments before we get to the sermon, if you would please. But in this day and this hour, where there is so much racial tension, political uh, polarization, where there is gender inequality, where there is immigration crisis, that in this day and this hour, I have to believe that Almighty God wants to use His church to be a witness during this day and this hour. We may not have all of the answers, but every one of these situations, there is a group of people, and where there's people, God wants us to demonstrate His greatness and His goodness. We need to be a people that get involved with the truth of God's word and do the unthinkable by the way we treat and love the world that is around us. Remember, it has been said, the world is not changed by our opinion, but by our example. So we want to reach the world that is around us. May I say real quickly that it is God's will that everyone hear the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. May I remind us that it's God's will for everyone to at least hear the message of God's love, of God's grace, of God's deliverance, and may I add to it God's power. He wants us. Jesus has himself told us in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the... Can I say it like we mean it? The world. God loves the world. God loves the world. God loves the sinner. God loves the addict. God loves the, the, the confused. God loves the imprisoned. God loves those that are in bondages. God loves those that are in other religions. God loves the confused. God loves those that are on their way to hell and don't know why it and fighting their way for it. But God loves them and he wants us to love, he wants to, us to love them and to share his message of grace with them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in them not just the Jews and not just the church, but whoever believes. He's wanting to bring out this wonderful invitation to the world that is around us, that through him they can be saved. It's God's desire, the great promise of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Do we like Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Yes. Yes, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. But it's not just so that us Pentecostals and Charismatics can get together and pray in the Spirit and exercise the gifts of the Spirit. For God said through Jesus, for Terry in Jerusalem, that you might receive the power of the Holy Spirit that it was promised so that you might be a what? That's pretty weak. So you could be a what? So you could be a witness to other Christians? A witness to the lost world. We have the power of the Holy Spirit for the main purpose in our lives. We have the regeneration at new birth, but after that there is a power to come upon us to be a witness to the world. Isn't that good news? And reveals to us a purpose in the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Wow. I think it's interesting here that the new believers, the church, as they were starting to grow in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, that they were a group of Jewish believers that accepted Jesus as their Messiah and their Savior. They were a group of Jewish believers that had, that had come to the fullness of understanding Christ as their Messiah and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them that Joel had spoken of. They were accepting that and they were excited about that and they were sharing it with their other Jewish friends and families and believers. But in Acts chapter 10, if you're there, or turn there real quickly if you would please, it's almost 10 years after the resurrection, almost 10 years after the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon them and the 120 in the upper room, almost 10 years has gone by and the thought has never even entered into their mind to tell the Gentiles about Jesus was unthinkable 
They thought this was just for the Jews, just for their nation, just for their people. And before we get too critical, we kind of get to that, that mindset too, that we think that sharing the message of Jesus is just for people like me, just for my group, just for my uh, ethnicity, just for, for my background. And I want us today, today to make sure that we, we, we shake our brains a little bit and understand that for God so loved the world... And there's no one that is eliminated or that God doesn't want us to share Jesus with. And the power of the Holy Spirit is in our life so that we can step outside of our comfort zone. Step outside of just those people that like us and that accepts us. And we step into wherever God gives us opportunity to be and to demonstrate his love, his greatness, and his power. Here it is 10 years later, and it still has not entered into their mind to share Jesus with the lost world around them. It's easy for us to stop and say, man, how did they miss that? But how many people do we walk by every day? How many neighborhoods do we drive through every day? How many people do we, we pass by every day because they might dress different than us, think different than us, talk different than us, and, and that God could never use me to reach into their lives? We need to awaken in this day and an hour and understand that there is a great God that wants to use us in some unthinkable ways, and it will demonstrate his power and his glory in our lives. Now, to be able to just be clear, I want to do something today that I don't normally do, and that's what I want to read. Acts chapter 10. And I know it's a large chapter, but I also know that, that the word of, I can't preach better than the word is just read. If you'll just open up and receive it in your life. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to, to speak to you, to stir in you as we're reading through Acts chapter 10, not just from a historical perspective, not just from a, a, a looking through a, a window perspective into a time zone, but allowing the Holy Spirit to challenge you today. As we read through this, it is almost, almost beyond imagination as we see signs and wonders, as we see angels, and as we see the Holy Spirit speaking and people with, uh, going into a trance and, and the Holy Spirit speaking to them and, and the manifestations, it, it's almost beyond what could be uh, uh, put together as some kind of a sci-fi movie projector uh, screen uh, a play here. But this is reality. This is God. And this was not just to start the church and the Gentiles. This is the church for Jesus Christ in our day and our hour. God still is a supernatural God. God still wants to move through his church supernaturally. And he'll do whatever. That song we sang about reckless love. He's going to do whatever it takes if we'll be willing to listen. But may I also say, it shouldn't take a trance, an angel... And, 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 and God moving halfway around the world to be able to get us to go and to do what he's called us to do. We should be ready and able. Amen? Let's start reading here. Acts chapter 1, an amazing story of when God asks us to do the unthinkable and has the unimaginable results of simple obedience in our lives. There was a centurion named Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion who was from the Italian band or cohort a devout man. We're basically saying he was a, a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. He goes on here, verse 2, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his house, who, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He's not even a believer and he's doing the right things. Incredible. At, and in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw uh, clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up, before me, uh, be, uh, come up for a memorial before God. Let me stop right here and pause. It appears that heaven knows what you do with your money. Just think about that for a while. Here this guy's not even saved. And because of his generosity, his alms and giving to the poor through the Jewish people there, that it says it has come up to as a memorial before God. Incredible. It goes on here and, and verse 5, it says, and now he sent men to Joppa and said, uh, 
uh, your prayers have come out. Now, now send men, he said, this is what the angel says, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Very clear. He is lodging in, uh, uh, with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who had spoken to him disappeared, Cornelius called two of his household servants and devout soldiers from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained in all the things that had happened to him, he sent them to Joppa. Now the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to, to the city, Peter was up in the, the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were making ready, he fell into a trance. Trance is, is like a dream or a vision. But it's where you're, you just uh, are almost uh, become sustained in, in you just people you don't even know what's going on around you, you just are, are just uh, almost frozen in space at that particular time. He fell into a trance and he saw heaven open, an object uh, like a great sheet that came down with four corners descending to him and, and let down for, to the earth, in, in where all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds. Inside of this was all things that it was not kosher for Jewish people to eat. These were all forbidden for them according to the law for them to eat. And a voice came to him saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. New Living Translation says, No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish law have declared in, in a pure or unclean. So it was unthinkable for him. Now we have this symbolism here, but now he's starting to have the applications going to be revealed to him. And a voice uh, spoke to him uh, uh, again a second time. What God has cleansed, you shall not call common. That was done three times, and then the object was taken up into heaven. Now while Peter wondered within himself what the vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who were sent from Cornelius... And folks, this is, could not be just coincidental. You see how God is putting this all together to explain. This is unthinkable how God so orchestrated all of this. These men that were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, whose surname is Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are, are, are seeking you. Arise, Therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had sent for him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a, a great man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house. And to hear the words that you have. And then he invited them to lodge with them. And the next day Peter went away with them. The same brother and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them. I want to pause here and say there is a man of great expectation here. Cornelius has no clue what really he's waiting for. He just knows that God wants to reveal something in his life. There's a great amount of people, folks, that, that have no idea the message of salvation, but they have a great desire to know the truth and to know God. They need people like us that know the truth, not just have an opinion, but want to come in and share with them the message of Jesus Christ. That doesn't want to come in there and straighten them out and say, you need to stop eating pork, and you need to stop doing this, and you need to stop doing that, but walk in and say, there's a God that loves you right where you want wants to share his message of love and forgiveness and transform and change your life. And here we have Cornelius is waiting, waiting with such expectation that he's called his relatives and his close friends. And Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, for I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Verse 28, then he said to them, you know how unlawful, we could add in there, unthinkable it is for a Jewish man 
to keep company or to go in and be with or to be seen with people like you and to keep company with anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call anything unclean or uncommon. No one is beyond or below me going and being with if I'm sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, is the Holy Spirit stirring on the inside of you? Any group of people, any section of, of our society, any other religion that you would think, I would never want to be seen in that situation. I would never want to be seen with those kind of people. Folks, I'm not asking you to go hang out. I'm not asking you to go partying. I'm not asking you to go to the club. I'm asking you that wherever you go, you represent Jesus Christ and that everywhere there is darkness, there is the need of a light. There is the need of a light of someone that realizes they are sent by God to be able to share his message of love and forgiveness, his message of power. Peter, 10 years after the resurrection, 10 years after the Holy Spirit coming upon them in the book of Acts chapter 2, 10 years later, finally finally gets to this point that he has this great, amazing revelation that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has to have a hold of, an understanding that it, even in our makeup or our thinking, we might feel uncomfortable or maybe it's not, we would never naturally go into this situation, that, but that God is showing us today that what God has said is clean, is worth saving, is worth living, is worth transforming, is that, that if it was worth Jesus dying for, it's worth us reaching into. And stirring that up on the inside of us. Verse 29, therefore I come without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked then, for what reason you have sent? So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me with bright clothing, speaking of that angel, and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard in alms as a remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore for jo uh, to Joppa and call Simon, whose uh, surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the seashore. When he comes, he will speak to you. Isn't it amazing that the angels do not have the privilege of speaking the gospel? God can use them, direct them to us, but we have the privilege of speaking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this day and this hour, the church, if we don't speak up, the world doesn't hear. We need to have that voice going forth in our lives and see the opportunity. But can you imagine the stirring on the inside of Peter for just a moment? This individual that is in a situation that he thought he would never be at. He's just experienced this revelation from God to not call anything unclean or, or to understand that even the Gentiles have the privilege of the message of Jesus. And then he gets there and Cornelius starts to explain that he's seen an angel and has had this, this, this revelation given to him and the precise revelation, the precise ex who to go to, where he's at exactly, the house to even go to to ask for this person to come to him. I can only imagine a stirring on the inside of Peter of what is God doing here? It's uneasy in one sense and an, and an amazement in another. He didn't have the time to prepare a sermon. He didn't have the time to, to go through and to, to bring up charts of how God is maybe going to reach into the Gentiles. He didn't have a time to prepare something and get the worship team all together so that our songs coordinate with some media presentation and maybe they could do a skit that would kind of go along with this too. He was just ready at the moment. I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm going to put myself in a place that I'm going to trust God to use me. And he comes to this moment where Cornelius says, the angel said that when you come, you're going to speak to us. So I sent for you immediately, and, and, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we, we, we're all present here before you to hear all the things commanded by God. This is a Holy Ghost setup, folks. And then I don't know if you're sensing the, the excitement of the building of this moment. We've read through these scriptures so often. You, you, in your mind, you know the story and how it goes so quickly. We almost need to slow it down. We need to look at the instant replay a little bit here from the different angles. 
and see what God is building and what is the expectation of what's going on in this situation. That they're there, that the house is full of, of close friends and relatives. None of them have heard the message of salvation. Peter and a couple of folks that he brought with him are there, these Jewish folks that have experienced salvation, experienced the fullness of the Spirit, and they're kind of uneasy about being in amongst all of these known sinners. And they're there. They want to hear. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth. Could everyone just drop a jaw for a moment? Just open his mouth. You know, most of us usually have to try to work on the other direction. Keeping our mouth closed. Controlling it. But Peter at this moment, it just seems he just, okay God, I'm going to open my mouth. And kind of like on the day of Pentecost when you filled us with the Spirit and we began to speak with other tongues that we didn't understand with our mind, we're going to open our, I'm going to open my mouth. And even though it's going to be in a natural tongue that I understand, it's going to still come from the Holy Spirit in my life because I don't know what to say. Will you please get yourself in some places that you don't know all the answers? Will you, will you please allow the Holy Spirit to pluck you up and to put you in the middle of some places that you're going to have to trust Him to be able to speak through you? It's wonderful in this day and age, and it's just somewhat of our church culture, that when you come to a church meeting like this, you expect the verses to already be put on the screen. You expect the, the, everything to kind of flow together. And then you expect me to have a sermon. And, and we even are taught in, in, our, in, in, a, in religious education that you need a three-point sermon. And I was, 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 was informed that if you have a three-point sermon, and if all of those three points start with the same word, that then people will remember it better. And if under those three points, if you all start with uh, some subpoints, and if they all start with the same letter, then it will make more sense to people. And, and, and you have to need a transitional statement to be able to take people from the opening to where you want them to go. Where is the Holy Ghost in your life to bring all things to remembrance? I'm not that good of a, of a, of a, I, I'm not that good of a talker. But I'll tell you what, if you'll listen, the Holy Spirit wants to say something. And sometimes you need to open your mouth and not expect some well-performed and polished presentation. You need the, the profound truth of God to flow out of your life. He opens his mouth. And he says, it is a truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. If you have your Bible open... Could you at least underline that in your Bible? Or if you're taking notes, maybe write that down, that God does not show partiality. God does not love you more than he loves me. And it's hard for us to grasp with our natural comprehension, but this is the truth. God does not love you more than the lost either. God does not love you more than the Muslim. God does not love you more than the Hindu. God does not love you more than the atheist. He loves us all the same. God is not partial. It's when we receive his love that it starts to transform and change our lives. Verse 35, he says, but every nation, whoever fears God and, and works of righteousness is accepted of him. The, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. I don't know what translation you've got, but I like the one I'm reading from here. That, that's our message. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord over all of us. Amen? He's, he's what brings us all together. That we preach peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The word that, that you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, verse 37, and, and began from Galilee after the baptism of John's preaching... How God anointed Jesus of Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power and went about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Peter is preaching one of the shortest sermons you've ever heard and has better results than any ten preachers I know. He's preaching this short message starting here in verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 39, and, when he, and, and we are witness of all these things which he has both it done in this land in Jerusalem, Judea, and, and was killed and hung on a tree. Him God raised from the dead the third day and showed him openly, 
not all, to all people, but to the witnesses chose before God, even to us who ate and drank with him before he, uh, excuse me, after he was raised from the dead. And he commanded us to preach, to preach to the people, and to testify that he is who he was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Verse 43, to him all the prophets and, and the witnesses that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words. Look at that view, how short that little uh, sermon was that Peter got out there. How God anointed of Jesus, how they had seen him resurrected after the dead, and how through remission of sins is to all those that believe in him. While he's preaching, they didn't wait for an altar call. They didn't wait for just as I am. They didn't wait for a nice worship song to come up at the end. While Peter is still saying these words to them, the Holy Spirit fell upon all that heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Can you imagine the impact this moment in history had? Can you imagine as these, these good Christian Jewish, spirit-filled pillars of the church showed up and shared Jesus just opened their mouth and Peter told a little story. And while Peter is talking, the Holy Spirit rushes in upon them. And it seems that the whole house of Gentiles that didn't know nothing, didn't know how they're supposed to act in church. No one had taught them how you're supposed to do these things. But they just opened themselves up and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They're saved. They're filled with the Spirit. They're speaking in this heavenly language. And who was amazed? Who was amazed? It was the believers. Oh my gosh. God, do you know what you just did? Who is it that we limit God to move in because we think God could never work in that person's life? And Peter says, hey, same Holy Spirit that came upon us has come upon them. It's obvious. We can't forbid them from being baptized in water since they've already gotten saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I guess it's okay that they get water baptized. Church, I want us to be shaken. I don't know about you. I don't want to be one of those good Christians that's filled with the Spirit, but we're astonished that God worked in somebody's life like that. That when you hear that so-and-so got saved, I don't want your response to be, man, I would never guess that one. Shouldn't there be a stirring on the inside of us that it's God's will for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? And a desire within us that regardless of their political background, regardless of their gender identity, regardless of their religious affiliation, there is a God in heaven that loves them and wants to transform their lives with a message that Jesus has come to bring remission of sins and wants to bring them into the household of faith. There should be a stirring of expectation. And I have to believe that in that stirring of expectation, there develops an atmosphere for the miraculous. Folks, sometimes we need some angels to help us out. Sometimes we need some trances to help us out, some visions to help us out. Sometimes we need some words of wisdom. In this one chapter, we have all of that going on for this purpose. This one purpose. Not just so that the whole Gentile nations can hear the gospel, but this time it's for Cornelius and his household of that he's brought together. Isn't it incredible what God is willing to do to just reach a few? Isn't it incredible that he's willing to send angels, put people in trances, give them words of knowledge, bring all of these things together for this moment so he could share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with their lives? Isn't it incredible that God took a whole chapter of 40-some verses 
to be able to reach a few. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to do? And a side thought, it shouldn't take an angel, a trance, and a word of knowledge to get us to share the gospel with other people either. Amen? It shouldn't take heaven kicking us in the encouragement zone to be able to go out and do what we've already been told to do. Unless it's unthinkable. Unless we're like Jonah and think they don't deserve it. Unless we're like the rich young ruler and say it's not worth it. Unless we're like Ananias and say that person's got a reputation. I don't know if I want to go talk to them. Unless we're like Peter, it's not so, Lord. I've never been around something like that. I've never, I've never, alcohol has never passed through my lips. And, sm and smoke has never gone through my nostrils, Lord. I would never get in a situation like that. If we're not careful, our personal, religious, pious attitude can keep us from reaching into people's hearts and lives that God can say, if you will go and share the message, I want to demonstrate my power in their lives and share my power to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Who's the unthinkable in your life? Isn't it time for us to stir ourselves up just a little bit or maybe even a lot and say, I it's not enough for me just to be saved and go into heaven. It's not enough just for us to be a good church that, that, that we don't have any problems. It's not enough for us just to hold out till Jesus comes. It's time for us to get up and go out there and find some dark spots. Some people that are in hopeless situations. That really know that, that, that need God in their life. And they want to hear this message. And share the love of Jesus with them. Well, Pastor, what if nothing happens? Right? It could happen. What if it does happen? What do you want to be on? Which end do you want to be? Are you want to play it safe? Or is it time for us to take a risk and reach into people's hearts and their lives and share the love of Jesus with? There's a whole world that does not deserve. But there's all of us that don't deserve either. We're not going with the who deserves it. We're going with who needs it. And we all need love and forgiveness in our lives. Father God, we just pause this, at this particular moment. And we repent in the sense that we ask for a, a move of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us individually. Forgive us, Father God, for building up walls that are too high for our expectations to get over. That we have, we have eliminated whole groups of people and so that we could never reach into their lives. We've maybe even thought that God doesn't want to work in their lives. We ask that the Holy Spirit would send us as missionaries every day into our world. That we would wake up every single day expecting God to use us. To share with someone who is lost. Hurting. That needs you. Needs forgiveness. Needs your love in your life. That we wake up every day saying the power of the Holy Spirit is upon me, not just so that I can make it through the day, but so that I can be a witness to someone today and the power of God to be in manifestation in their lives. That we don't just have to, to bring in someone like Jacob next week to be a, a testimony of the grace of God. But Lord, we ask that in this church they would be lined up. People that have experienced your saving grace and lives are transformed and changed. We pray for the day that, that the harvest is plenteous and that we are reaching out to them and bringing in the harvest by the power of the Holy Spirit into this place so that they're growing up and knowing Jesus in their lives. We're asking you, Father God, to, to shake us. And if, if it needs it, Lord, by revelation, if it needs by a, a vision, if it needs, Father God, by a word of wisdom, whatever it needs, but shake us in this day and this hour to reach out to the world that is around us. That they're not just drawn to a building, but they're, 
they're drawn to Christ in us. And that they would say, ah, something tells me that you know what I need to know. And then we would just open our mouth and you would fill it. So we ask, Holy Spirit, use us in this day and this hour. Use us in ways that would even astonish us. That is beyond our thinking or imagination. Because when we do the unthinkable, the effects are unimaginable. What you can accomplish in your church. In Jesus' name.